on bail. Bailey on bail. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and there's none like you, Lord. This morning, once again, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way, Lord. And we pray that the Holy Ghost would just surround this place in a special way, along with your angels. I pray, Lord, that our hearts and our minds would be in one mindset and one accord, Lord, that they would be good soil for your word to fall on, that we may remember it throughout the week. But even greater than that, that it would take root in our hearts, that we would be transformed into your very image, even Father. Anoint my mind and my lips bring forth the words you have us to hear. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Bailing on bail. When we talk about bailing, we're, it's simply like a departure, a leaving. And if we start looking into this passage here, we find that is exactly what Elijah is trying to do. He is telling the people that either you're going to serve Baal or you're going to serve God. You've got to pick which one you're going to serve. You can't serve both. And he's gathered all of Israel on top of Mount Carmel. Keep in mind that this time is the time of the divided kingdom. Ten tribes on one side, two tribes on the other. They are divided. There's a king in the north with a god set up to Baal where they would come and bring their babies every year and sacrifice them there in the valley of Tophet. You have a reigning king who really isn't a king, but rather is being ruled by his wife, Jezebel. And Jezebel serves the prophet Baal. Elijah is here on Mount Carmel issuing a challenge to Israel and a statement. Either you're going to serve God or you're going to um, serve Baal. Are you going to bail on Baal and serve God? Are you going to stay with Baal? You have to make a decision. As I was studying this out, it began thinking, you know, Israel's always had a trouble with idolatry. That's nothing new. They've always had trouble with idolatry. And we go all the way back to Abraham. Abraham's father was an idol maker. We know that Abraham went down into Egypt when he wasn't supposed to go. And what is Egypt? A land full of idols. In fact, in scriptures, it's symbolic of the world. And it wasn't just bad enough for Abraham to go down to uh, Egypt, but then Isaac goes down to Egypt. And then Joseph gets sold into Egypt. And then instead of leaving, Abraham, uh, not Abraham, but Jacob comes down with the rest of the sons and they make a permanent residence in Egypt, a land full of idols. And they get stuck there for 430 years. Exodus 12 and verse 40 states, Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. They went to the land of idols, and they were there a lot longer, probably than they ever thought they would be. But God comes down and He delivers them, and they come across into and they cross the Red Sea, brother, in a miraculous way. You know, God doesn't always deliver us from our problems. Sometimes He makes us a way to endure through the problem. But they get to the other side. God comes down to meet them, but they're afraid. God's there on Mount Sinai, and the children of Israel are absolutely terrified. No, Moses, you go speak with God. So Moses goes up onto the mountain, spends 40 days and 40 nights speaking to God. Meanwhile, what are the children of Israel doing? They're worshiping Baal. They're... But why? Are they worshiping a golden calf? Because in my mind, no, Baal's not raw. Why did they choose the gap, the calf or cow figure? Why did they choose the bull figure to worship? Because throughout of the rest of Israel's history, what other gods do they serve? Really, they might serve Ashtaroth, but nine times out of ten it's Baal. 
There is no other figures of Ra, no other figures of Poseidon. It's always the cow. Why always the cow? Just doing a little bit of quick research for my mind's eye, when they were in Egypt, the cow god went by the name Apis, Api, Happy, or Hep, one of those four, at different times. It turns out that during this time, there were three main bull gods that were worshipped in Egypt, and they had their own cults. And when we look at what is known as Apis, who is also the Canaanite god Baal, he was the most highly regarded of all the bull deities. He is believed to be the first god of Egypt. Not much is known about him until the New Kingdom, which is right between 16 and 11 BC. It's believed that Moses took the Israelites out of Egypt around 1446 BC, so it falls right in that time frame. It's also the height of the Egyptian um, power throughout their entire history. They, their power was at a height here. They were at maximum power. It was the peak of their power. And when we look at Apis, he was worshipped in May, Memphis, which is up there in the north, not far from Cairo. And if you follow the Nile Delta, it would have been very easy because Goshen was right there on that last strand of the Delta. And it fed right down into Memphis. So is that where they came up with worshiping the god Baal? Also, Apis served as a go-between between humans and other deities. And he represented eternity itself in the harmonious balance of the universe, according to worldhistory.org. And he was always associated with the king of Egypt, along with other meanings. He represented strength and vitality of the reigning monarch. So when we start looking at why they might have had the bull figure, that's why. He was powerful to them. They seen him throughout Egypt, but it was something that they picked up. Do you realize that it's very easy for us to have a veil in our own life? It doesn't have to be the most powerful thing out there. It doesn't even have to be sin. They might have been the, Apis might have been the first deity in the Egyptian, um, if you want to say God lineage or how you put it, hierarchy. But Ra was the most prominent back then. But still they clung to Baal. Baal held them back throughout their entire history. And it really wasn't Baal, it was them choosing Baal. They had to choose which God they serve. Does that not sound familiar? Do not the words of Elijah here sound familiar? Elijah stated in 1 Kings 18, 21, and he said, How long will call ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Joshua 14 and verse 15. And if it seemeth evil unto you to serve the Lord this day, uh, serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, which were probably ancestors, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Just like we were talking about, about in Sunday school, man has free will. We can choose who we're going to serve. That's what fell down to Adam and Eve. Were they going to serve God? Or were they going to go by their own opinions? Were they going to do what they wanted? What were they going to choose? And today is no different. We're coming up on a revival this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And what is revival? It's a revival is a bringing back to life, a renewal. It's when you get into that fire and you start turning those things around, start making, creating some air underneath to get that 
flame kindled once again. You know, sometimes in this Christian walk, things can creep in. Sometimes small things. But it's the small boxes that spoil the vine. Sometimes it's just being so busy that it takes away from our time with God. You know, what are we doing anymore? Are we spending as much time in our Bible and in prayer as we once did? Or has something crept in and started taking away, maybe even chipping away at that time? You know, we have to be careful about how we spend our life. We have to keep making sure that in our life, in the words of the Apostle Paul, that we are thus minded, constantly pressing towards the mark, because if we're not constantly pressing, that's when those little things start creeping in. We start getting distracted. And now we're no longer where we once were with Christ. Doesn't mean that we're backslidden, not necessarily, but it's just those things that are chipping away and keeping us from being where we should be with God. And that's what Elijah's doing here. He is calling out Israel and saying, hey, you're going to have to make a choice. Which God are you going to serve? You can't choose both of them. Because the Bible tells us that God is a very jealous God. So jealous, in fact, if we would get down to the basic rule of thumb when it comes to uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy, we just narrow it down typically in Ten Commandments. We don't go through all the books, but we'll narrow down to ten commandments. We'll even post them on our wall. But you realize that five out of ten commandments all deal with God directly. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And, with, and I don't list the other two, and this is why I get in trouble. But five out of ten commandments all deal directly with God. The first two or three, the first three commandments, deal specifically with idol worship. Three commandments. That's roughly one-third of the ten commandments deal directly with idol worship. Why? Because things creep in and they take us away from God. They start taking our time away from God. They start cutting into our prayer lives. Those things that we enjoy doing more than spending time with God. We need to make sure that we get rid of those things. Push them aside. It's not always sin. But how do we get changed? By spending time in the presence of God. By spending time in the Word. By spending time in prayer. Allowing the Holy Ghost to change us. That's when we become revived. That's when we become thus like-minded and being perfect. That's when we are constantly keeping at the forefront of pressing towards the mark of the high calling of Jesus Christ. That's why we, when we are constantly aware that life is short and we have to do something for Christ now. Because now is day and night cometh when no man can work. We need to get the bales out of our life. We need to bail on bail that we may press toward God that we may know him even more. Elijah here was making a statement, not just to Israel, but to Ahab, Jezebel, all the followers of Baal, all of Israel. He gathered them on top of Mount Carmel. And then he did something that I think is incredible. He made the prophets of Baal bring their own sacrifice and then bring him his sacrifice as well. You bring me two calves. I'm not going to provide the sacrifice. You bring me the two calves. And we'll go from there. And there are the prophets of Baal on top of Mount Carmel crying out to Baal from morning to noon with no response. 
And you can almost hear these words being echoed once again. If the Lord God be God, follow him. And if Baal be God, then follow him. And Elijah begins making fun of Baal. You know what? Maybe your God can't hear you because he's off on a long journey. And he gets so brazen that he goes so far as telling the prophets of Baal, you know what? Maybe Baal can't hear you because he's off defecating somewhere. Literally, that is what the translation reads. He is off in the bathroom somewhere. And when no response happens, if Baal be God, then follow him. And if the Lord be God, then follow him. And with an extremely short prayer, and I'm sure it's because Elijah had already spent a long time in prayer. The fire of God comes down. And not only does it come down and consume the sacrifice, but Elijah made sure to echo those words once again. If Baal be God, then follow him. If God be God, then follow him. And before the fire even comes down, Elijah has him build a trench and dump 12 barrels of water on top of the entire sacrifice in a time of drought. Soak the thing. Make sure that natural fire cannot even be, can even ignite it. And then he states the prayer. Now think, people follow a lot of things in this life. And sometimes we just allow the business of life to interfere. But we need to make sure that we root all those things out. That God can have a stronghold in our lives. That we can be drawn closer to him than ever before. That we don't get so consumed in life that we forget that life is short. And not only is he coming back at any moment, but none of us know when we're going to take our last breath either. We need to make sure that we have all the veils out of our life before that day when we see him. Either by death or by way of rapture. But today is the day of salvation. Today is the day we need to make sure that everything is under the blood. Today is the day that we need to make sure that once again we are holy and fully consecrated over to God. Which is our reasonable service. Because God is calling out and desiring a relationship greater than you and I could ever dream or imagine. I'm a firm believer that to this day, if someone got so close to God, he just might pull an Enoch and Elijah and say, you know what? The rapture isn't happening yet, but why don't you come on home with me right today? I do believe an individual can get that close to God. As Sister Beth comes to the piano, 2 Corinthians 6, 17 states, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. If we're going to see a revival, it's only going to be when we make sure that there is absolutely, positively, no idols in our life. When we make sure that there is absolutely nothing that is distracting us from spending time with God. When there is absolutely nothing that is taken away from our prayer life and our Bible reading, when we make sure that we are fully consecrated over Him, when we have our priorities right, because when it comes down to it, where does the revival begin? It begins with you. It begins with me. More importantly, if we ask that question, where does revival begin? It begins with the one who is staring back at us in the mirror. God wants to do it more than we could ever dream or imagine. But we have to make sure that there is absolutely nothing that is trapped in and taking our attention away from God. And that is the desire of His heart this morning. Why don't we find ourselves a place of prayer?